This video is a slightly different way into the symbolism of William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Because virtually everything in the novel is symbolic of something, um, I want to explore this simple idea just using the chapter headings. For each heading, I'll try to look at Golding's intentions. Because, as always, that's where the A and A star grades are. So the first thing I notice about the first chapter is the alliteration of the S sound, um, which you'll remember is called sibilance, the sound of the shell. This is a deliberate attempt to recreate a peaceful image. Golding can be doing this for a range of symbolic reasons. Uh, the first one is an ironic use. It sounds peaceful, but these boys have just crash-landed on an island uh, many of them have died, still trapped in the pod released um, by the pilot that has crash-landed on the island. And wider society itself um, may be largely destroyed because it's a nuclear explosion that's brought them to the island. So here, Priestley is suggesting that peace is an illusion and reality is violence. And that's one of the major themes of the novel. A shell is also a protective coating, which uh, here is interesting because the animal that used to live inside it has died. So Golding could be suggesting that there is no protection. Um, if we take this as a view of wider society, now that we have invented nuclear weapons, we have no suitable defence. In the end, we're all going to die, no matter what our defence is, because of this terrible new weapon we've um, developed. To have this interpretation you can't just rely on the novel itself. Um, you have to link the fact of the nuclear explosion that has brought um, the boys to this island to the historical context, um, the developing Cold War and the fear that Russia and America would develop nuclear arsenals that would eventually uh, lead to one of them launching a nuclear attack against the other. You could also take a more optimistic view and look at the sound of the shell as that first stirrings of the impulse towards democracy. So here are these boys um, who have arrived on the island in the middle of a nuclear war and yet their first thought, um, with Piggy's help, is towards democratic government. So that despite society appearing to destroy itself through war, there is the hope that it could rebuild itself through a democratic impulse. Fire on the Mountain um, quickly reverses this view. So this is the point at which the boy with the mulberry mark gets killed, burnt by fire that the boys have unleashed carelessly. This fire might symbolise the boys' innate violence and actions. Even when they're not trying to kill people, they still do. This could symbolise that all of humanity is deeply destructive, or that all men are deeply destructive. There is no innocent state. The boy with the mulberry mark also represents um, the first murder. It's reminiscent of Cain's killing of his brother Abel that causes God to mark him out with what becomes known as the Mark of Cain. There is another Christian allusion in the title. Um, it was the fire of the burning bush that led Moses up the mountain to retrieve the, main, uh, the Ten Commandments, the main one of which is, Thou shalt not kill which the boys will break right now. And there is another commandment, uh, Thou shalt have no other god but me, and they're going to break that also by worshipping the Lord of the Flies, uh, the beast, uh, the pig's head on a stick. So whereas the title suggests Christian morality, uh, the boys actually behave in a completely unchristian way throughout the rest of the novel. And that starts here. The next chapter title, Huts on the Beach, 
acts as a sort of parody for the British seaside, where the huts would be bathing huts and the beach would be a source of joy to holidaymakers. This again is used ironically. Um, Golding is suggesting that the boys will recreate England on their beach, but it won't be the stuff of holidays, it will be the warlike stuff of nightmares, uh, reliving the Second World War that the country has just endured. Golding is using it to suggest that this is our natural state, um, despite the appearance of all our seaside towns, suggesting that our natural state is more peaceful. The other thing to notice about the huts on the beach is that they are quickly abandoned. They are a brief attempt uh, for the boys to recreate civilization, but they can't do it. Even Simon disappears, leaving only Ralph um, to complete these makeshift huts. So they become a symbol of quite how weak civilization is. Even if the huts had been built, they'd be very frail and symbolising the frailty of civilization, but they're hardly even built. Uh, only one is built successfully, which suggests that civilization again, is not man's natural state. It's just a temporary structure that we've been lucky to have, but war is our true state. In this way, Golding doesn't see the Second World War as a great victory over evil. He sees it as only a temporary victory, and future war is inevitable, as symbolised by the atomic bomb that brings the boys to the island. With the chapter painted faces and long hair, Golding is symbolising the decline of English civilization through the changing natures of the boys' appearance. When they get rid of their uniforms, they at once look more innocent because they're more naked, but they also become more their true selves. Once Jack works out how to paint his face, he takes on the mask of violence. It is easier for him to be violent with his face mask. And Golding also suggests that it is easier for Jack to be truly himself as it is for the other boys once they started uh, painting their faces. The irony here is that when they paint their face they create a disguise, but they paint a new face which reveals their true identity, what they're really like. And then the long hair uh, suggests the transformation from smartly cut schoolboy. Civilization is therefore a veneer that will disappear quickly in the same time it takes for a boy's hair to grow long. It only takes a month or two for these young boys, all educated at private school, with well-educated parents, apart from Piggy, um, very quickly, within the matter of a month or two, descend into violence. In a tragedy, this happens because the hero has a fatal flaw amongst otherwise very good qualities. This isn't that kind of tragedy. Golding is suggesting that all of the boys are flawed. There are no heroes. There are only boys who commit fewer murders than others, as we'll see in the later chapters. A final piece of symbolism uh, in this chapter is what's missing from this picture. This one is in black and white, but you will remember that Jack paints his face with a combination of red and black as well as white, uh, deliberately reminiscent of the German swastika. To have English boys taking on the Nazi colours is deeply ironic and suggests that the Nazis have won. They may have been defeated in the Second World War, but the cost of defeating them has been to become savage. This is a deeply pessimistic view, and you might read the ending of the novel to see that there is still hope.
But as we shall see when we arrive at the final chapter, you can also take a more nihilistic view and see that there is no hope. The title Beast from Water suggests that the beast is everywhere. The whole island is surrounded by water, and so there is no escape from the beast. And the beast represents mankind's inner evil. We might also look at the ironic symbolism where Jesus turned water into wine, but here water is being turned into sin. Another use of water in the Christian service is to baptise, to symbolically cleanse people of sin. But Golding inverts this and suggests that the water here creates the beast that comes from the water creates the sin. So perhaps Golding is suggesting that uh, even God cannot rid mankind of his natural capacity for evil. The beast from the water is also created by the boys. It comes from their own minds. Nobody actually sees a beast coming out of the water. Now, the only thing that goes into the water is the boys themselves. And so Golding is here also suggesting as Simon does in the novel, that they create the beast. And as soon as they find it can't be living on the island, rather than choose not to believe in a beast, they instead posit the idea that it must live in the sea, and that's why they can't find it. And this symbolises how mankind always needs an enemy, because an enemy will always breed the desire to fight. So in this reading... Our desire to fight, to be violent, is what drives the rest of our behaviour. We create a world in which fighting is necessary. Beast from the Air uh, picks up this idea and takes it a little further. Um, you'll notice that I called it From the Air, but Golding doesn't. This suggests that the beast is literally made from air. The beast is invisible but still everywhere. This is a clear metaphor for mankind's ability to sin and for mankind's desire for violence. It is also ironic here because the beast from air will be visible. It will be the dead pilot. And that suggests that the adult world also brings evil violence and sin, suggesting again that these boys are taught to be evil by their parents, even though their parents are trying to teach them upright British values and have no idea that they're promoting a violence in their offspring. Underlying this is the fact that the beast is a dead pilot. Um, so what the boys fear most is death itself, if we take this metaphor to its logical conclusion. Another way of looking that, at that is at the word pilot. A pilot is supposed to lead uh, somebody to safety, which is why ships were originally piloted in harbours. But this dead pilot is instead going to send Simon to warn the other boys that there is no beast, and ironically, thereby send Simon to his death. And so Golding could be suggesting that's what waits for us all. It is just death. In Shadows and Tall Trees, Golding gives us an insight into the character of Roger. Roger uses the shadows of the trees to throw stones at Henry. At first, making sure that he misses him, and foreshadowing the death of Piggy when Roger kills him with a boulder. There is a kind of um, literary joke that Golding is had, having here because the shadows um, link to the foreshadowing. It's his amused way of telling us that um, there will be a murder, Roger will be the killer. This foreshadows what he's actually going to do. The emphasis on height in tall trees uh, is also symbolic of the height from which the boulder will drop, uh, smashing Piggy and the conch. And it also emphasises the height of the coconuts that drop, just missing Roger, 
uh, because he remains oblivious to them. In other words, he remains oblivious to the possibility of his own death. We could also see the title as symbolic of the boy's uh, mental state. They don't look up at the tall trees, symbolising turning to a Christian god or to uh, moral behaviour. Instead, they look at the shadows and symbolically become consumed by darkness. As if to emphasise that point, that's the name of the next chapter. And so the shadows become darkness that the boys go into. In fact, they have gifts for it. And this gift is, of course, uh, death as symbolised by the head of the pig that they've killed. The pig's head becomes the symbol of the, the novel, the source of its title. The Lord of the Flies is a translation of Beelzebub. And Beelzebub was also the name uh, given in the New Testament variously to uh, demons from hell or to the devil himself. So because the title is a gift for the darkness, Golding is suggesting that it's not the devil who has influenced and tempted mankind, rather it's mankind who was sought out and created the devil. They choose to believe in a beast and they choose to give it a gift. In this reading, Golding's view of mankind is that Man is inherently evil. There is no way to change that. All you can do is try to control it. But in our natural state, we choose evil over good. This is emphasised in the next chapter heading, A View to a Death. Um, this is going to be the death of Simon. And on one level, the view is the fact that so many of the boys are onlookers. They watch while it happens. Indeed, they also participate. But it is also where the Lord of the Flies warns Simon um, that they're, they're going to do him. So Simon has a premonition here of his own death, much like Jesus did, knowing that he would be betrayed after the Last Supper and that this would result in his crucifixion. Simon is going to die in the same way as Jesus did, uh, trying to save the boys uh, from evil. He's going to tell them that the beast doesn't exist, it's just a dead pilot. And just like Jesus, he's going to be killed in the process. We might take another symbolic view here and decide that Golding writes this novel in order to explore um, a lack of Christian belief, or rather a loss of it, and so instead of being the most important death that has ever happened, Jesus' death to save us from our sins, um, it's now just a death, one amongst millions. Um, Jesus' death achieved nothing. Alternatively, we can take the Christian point of view um, because a view also means having a mind to or making a decision to. And it suggests that Simon's death is planned by a higher power, just as Jesus' death was planned by God. It was necessary for Jesus to die in order for him to be resurrected and prove to mankind that through faith in God, you too will be resurrected. Your soul also will join God's in heaven. And I think Golding deliberately sets up these two opposite polar opposite interpretations, because he wants us to come to a view by the end of the novel. Does God exist? Can he save us from evil? Or, regardless of whether he exists or not, are we inherently evil and we can't be saved from it? And, in fact, is there no God? Have we just created him in order to counterbalance the evil that we've created? When Simon is actually killed... Golding describes him being taken out to sea by uh, attendant creatures um, who glow phosphorescently as though giving Simon a halo or uh, being described themselves as like mini-angels taking him away. We might see this as deeply ironic, 
because Simon is just going to be dragged out to sea and uh, his body will disappear, or we can see it as symbolic of God's um, choosing him, just like he chose Jesus, in order to uh, symbolise saving mankind. Again, either interpretation, although they are complete opposites, is possible. The shell and the glasses are symbolic of civilization. So the shell we have seen represents democracy and the glasses represent reason and also hope. You see better through the glasses. So they are symbolic of Piggy's wisdom, although he's not always wise. And they're also symbolic of science. It's with the glasses that they can create fire and therefore achieve safety. Of course, the irony will be that it's also with the glasses that they can create fire that will destroy the island. And this, again, reminds us of the nuclear weapons. Yes, science has allowed us to create something that will keep us safe for all time because no one would dare use the atomic weapon in war. And then, no, science has done the opposite. The atomic bomb has been dropped in the world of Lord of the Flies and nothing is safe and no one is safe. The ending of the chapter is also deeply ironic because Piggy assumes that Jack has invaded um, their shelter in order to take the conch, the symbol of democracy. Piggy assumes that this symbol of democracy and civilization is much more important than the fire that will keep them warm as well as destroy. And perhaps Golding uses this to attack um, intellectualism and idealists. He suggests that brutality will always win out against people with very clever and even right ideas. And ultimately, democracy will always be too weak to stand up to dictatorship. It's also symbolic that Golding has broken the glasses at this stage. They're already cracked, um, as though suggesting that perfect sight is never possible. So science tries to lead us towards perfection, but it can always be used against us. Science has just made mankind more efficient at killing, which is why many more people died in the Second World War than the First. And most of those were civilians. Castle Rock is where Jack takes his tribe. Even an island which could be a kind of Eden, a kind of um, paradise, uh, still has inside it, or at its edge, this idea of a castle. Golding could therefore be suggesting once again that mankind is always drawn towards violence and therefore defence against violence. He could also be suggesting, through the word rock, that there is a kind of permanence about this. It's very difficult to overcome that desire um, to be violent, that desire to fight. Another interesting fact about this castle is that it's in the wrong place. We normally expect um, a castle to be at the highest vantage point where um, people could defend themselves against the widest possible area. But on this island, the castle is right at the end, and the rest of the island is dominated in the boy's mind by the beast. So symbolically, Golding could be suggesting that mankind will try to defend themselves against evil, but that only happens at the outer extremities. Um, evil is everywhere else, and so this idea that we can fight it off is perhaps doomed to fail. The final chapter is not called Rescue, even though that's what happens at the end. Instead, it's called Cry of the Hunters. And this is Golding's way of suggesting that it's not the rescue that's the most important thing. In fact, the rescue is incredibly implausible. Um, Golding makes fun of this by having them rescued by an officer in a white suit, which symbolises innocence but he arrives on a cruiser, um, effectively a weapon. 
and he also arrives with his own weapon, he is prepared to shoot the boys before he finds out that they're English. So when we look at the title this way, Golding could be suggesting that, uh, in fact, we're all hunters, that's what all men are, even the officer who arrives to save them. The word cry alludes very strongly to the last description of Ralph, who cries for the loss of innocence and the loss of his friends. We might see this as an offer of hope. Ralph is a young boy who is going to grow up uh, to be a man, and he's going to remember the lessons of democracy and the lessons of evil that he learnt on the island and change the future for the better. However, another reading of it is just to look at the title itself. It's the hunters who dominate, and their cry isn't of guilt or despair, it is of bloodlust. In this reading, there is no real rescue at all. Yes, the boys are being taken off the island, but they're just being taken to a larger society that is engaged in a larger war. So when we get to the end of the novel, we have those two choices to make. Is Ralph symbolic of the new world that is possible, or will he get sucked up by the very world that created war in the first place? And the fun of reading the novel is to come to a decision of your own. Which do you favour? And because I've dealt with the symbolism of each chapter, you know this video will help you no matter what your essay is because any extract will come from a particular chapter and you could use the chapter headings to describe all of the characters. I've dealt with Ralph, Jack, Piggy and Roger and those are the main characters that you could be asked about. In terms of your own revision, it would be really useful to identify one or two key quotations for each character and match them to your own pictures because it will make you think about the symbolism much more deeply. And if you're thinking about symbolism, you're always going to get an A or an A star. Good luck.